Well, thank you, Lisa. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be able to share with you today the results of a survey that uh, I collaborated with Kevin Erb from University of Wisconsin on and uh, uh, passed this information along. So I've had a couple of opportunities in my career to have positions that focus on risk management. And, and when I have worked with risk management, uh, one of the things that became very clear to me is when you're assess assessing a risk, I look at two things. I look at the, the frequency or the likelihood of a risk occurring, and I also look at the impact. And if that risk was to occur, how significant would it be? And certainly from a hog producer point of view, I don't think anybody would disagree that in terms of the potential of uh, your herd getting infected with PED and the consequences if that happened, that from a hog producer point of view, this very much is a risk that they need to manage and are managing uh, and are obviously very concerned about. Uh, I'm going to talk a lot today about practices that manure applicators uh, are following and some of the challenges they've got. But one thing I should say up front is that I am not aware at this point of any specific case where manure application has spread PED. Um, and so I don't want to create uh, any kind of paranoia or angst that, uh, oh my goodness, uh, this looks like uh, something that hasn't been uh, talked a lot about. Uh, having said that, that, the fact that I'm not aware of any cases doesn't mean that we shouldn't be vigilant. Uh, out of an abundance of caution, uh, we need to be vigilant. The industry is being vigilant, uh, and rightfully so, especially until more is learned about this disease and how it spreads. So when I think about risk management, um, you know, we use a lot of tools to manage risk. We establish procedures, we train our staff, we purchase equipment, we provide supervision and oversight. Uh, but the thing is, all those actions cost money. And so that's where judgment comes in in risk management. Because really, you can't eliminate risk in this world, but you can manage it and reduce it. And that's where the art in risk management comes in, is the judgment to know to what extent do you need to put in uh, actions and take actions to reduce the risk to an acceptable level. Um, finally, I would say that uh, every case is different. And so as uh, Lisa outlined, the health implications of an outbreak on a sow barn are different than the health implications on a, uh, an outbreak with a grow finished barn. And so uh, each case uh, is different and risk assessment should be done uh, with that in mind. So uh, having said that, um, when I learned about uh, uh, this disease and I read the protocols that had been put together, uh, it, it piqued some questions for me. And uh, um, so I got the idea with uh, a lot of help from Kevin of doing a survey. And some of the things we wanted to find out is, is have or how have Manure application practices, equipment, training, and communication changed as a result of PEDV. Um, we wanted to determine and learn, well, what are the biggest challenges that manure applicators are still facing? And perhaps most importantly, uh, what's working well? And what are some of the best practices out there that are being followed? And I hope to share a little bit with you today about that. So naturally, uh, when you want to learn the answers to a question, you should ask the experts. And really, in this case, the experts in my mind are the commercial or custom manure applicators, and that's exactly who we went to through this survey. Uh, we conducted the survey both online as well as face-to-face uh, -face at the North American Manure Expo last week in Springfield, Missouri. Um, putting the survey together was actually quite easy because uh, the protocol that Lisa mentioned earlier that uh, the American Association of Swine Vets and Chekhov has put together for manure application is excellent, and it was a great framework for us to couch the survey around. Um, and the final thing I'll say is that the survey was done with commercial or um, uh, for higher uh, manure applicators. And so anytime today that I mention applicators or I mention respondents, remember that I'm referring to commercial manure applicators. So when you hear about a survey, a logical question is, uh, how many uh, respondents were there and, uh, and where were they, what kind of background or where were they from? So uh, we 
we only launched this survey three or four weeks ago, so it, it was uh, came up in uh, fairly quick order. Uh, and over that time period, we had input from 47 custom applicators, and they do business in 15 states and provinces. Um, and I would like to thank all of the participants uh, for uh, voicing their uh, experiences and giving us their thoughts, because without that, I wouldn't have this information to pass on to you today. So one of the questions we ask them is, uh, to what extent are your swine clients talking to you about PEV? Have they mentioned it, expressed some concern, or asked you to change your practices? And not surprisingly, um, over half, 53% uh, of the respondents with swine clients said that most of their swine clients um, are talking with them about this. And so obviously, this is a hot topic of discussion between uh, hog producers and manure applicators, and rightfully so. I mentioned the protocol that Pork Board put together, and um, it's broken into three parts. There's a section on before pumping, and there's a series of protocols under that caption. There's pumping itself, and a series of uh, protocols under that caption, as well as after pumping. And I really like the way they put this together, because in my experience, and maybe you've seen this yourself, uh, when I need to get something done, um, my first inclination is just to jump right in and get started and, and swing into action. And uh, through experience and often through the hard way, I have learned that uh, it's far better to step back and, and invest a little bit of time, and sometimes a lot of time, in considering how should I proceed, what are the risks, uh, what could go wrong uh, before I just swing into action. And, and so I like the way this protocol is laid out because it really gives prominent billing to um, action and planning that should take place before the event. Um, I like the phrase start right and end right. My experience has been that when you start a process and you get off on the right foot, good things happen. And conversely, when you start something, if you get off on the wrong foot, it's really hard to recover afterwards. And so I think planning is probably the key to a successful job in manure application and many other things. Um, the other thing in the protocol is it stresses communication throughout, and of course that's important and uh, a very valuable um, practice. So going into the results, what we did was, and I'm, I'm going to go through two sections of the three today. I'm going to go through the results of before pumping and after pumping. So essentially what we did with the survey was we took the protocols, we took each um, element in the protocol, and we asked the uh, manure applicator to to tell us whether each section was, in their opinion, easy to implement, intermediate difficulty to implement, implement, or hard to implement. And so I've replicated the responses on this graph, uh, where easy is green, intermediate difficulty is yellow, and red is hard. And uh, in some cases, these don't sum to 100%, and that's partly because uh, not all uh, respondents answered every question, um, but I think this is valuable for us understanding where are manure applicators uh, having success and where are they finding some of the more difficult uh, uh, aspects of this to deal with. And so certainly um, the, there's two that obviously uh, shine out when it comes to uh, planning um, the manure application job. Um, so the, uh, the first one of these is uh, planning the entrance or exit to the farm to have minimal crossover. Um, sometimes um, farms don't have separate laneways that manure applicators can use that avoid the main traffic of the feed truck, the employee, the hog truck. Uh, so that can be difficult. And then also the other area that they're finding some challenges with is identifying and knowing where the line of separation is, and, and simply stated, um, the line of separation is the area that uh, it's, a, it's a, a line that indicates what area that the manure applicator and their equipment should be in, which is totally separate from the area used by daily farm traffic and personnel, including the barns and the livestock. And so we want to separate manure application activities and equipment and staff from anybody that comes in contact with the pigs, anything going on inside the barn, those two should never meet. Um, so that's the concept of line of separation. I will uh, later on uh, provide some examples of ways that uh, manure applicators are um, 
um, working with these concepts. So uh, start right, end right. So we've talked about start right planning, uh, end right after the pumping. Uh, once again, the protocols have a number of uh, steps that manure applicators follow. And I've just followed the same color scheme. And uh, uh, one of these, again, is, is planning the entrance. Uh, it's got to get caught up here. Is uh, uh, cleaning the equipment before going on to the next site. And as you can imagine, when we're talking about manure application equipment and the need to clean, disinfect, and dry that equipment, that's a challenge. Um, and as well, of course, uh, cleaning uh, the truck, the tractor, the cabs uh, is also proving uh, difficult for them. So in addition to specific questions about the protocol, I also wanted to ask some more general questions about change management and uh, uh, what their experience has been with managing change. And so um, um, the first uh, uh, information, I guess what I should explain about this graph is that the green bar represents areas where manure applicators indicate they have made changes as a respond, in response to PED. And the yellow indicates areas where they are planning to make changes in the next nine months. Um, and as you can see, just quickly looking at this, there's all kinds of changes that manure applicators have or are making um, in response to PED. So digging into the details, um, the most challenging area of change for them that I asked about right now is purchasing equipment specific to dealing with PED. 34% um, have done that, 23% are planning to, um, and so uh, obviously they're working on that um, and there's a, clearly a cost to that. Uh, some areas that they have they found were low-hanging fruit, if you will, and they could get out more quickly. Um, the second line item on here, uh, if I add the 81% uh, of changes already made with the 15% that are in the process of making changes, 96% of manure applicators uh, have or are planning to make changes in their procedures as a result of the PEV virus, 96%. Uh, farm changes that they're aware of, uh, looks like about 90%. Um, in terms of employee training, 81% um, have or will be making changes to the way they train their employees as a result of PEV. And finally, 94% uh, reported increased communications between themselves and producers or the farm owner as a result of this virus. And so clearly, um, by any way you look at it, uh, this, this uh, virus has been a game changer uh, for manure applicators and their swine clients. Uh, in terms of uh, managing the change, uh, we did ask uh, how are you uh, conveying this to your staff and how do you know that they understand and are following the protocols? Um, and so we've had 27% uh, in blue that, that uh, indicated they're doing that through established procedures. Uh, 24% of respondents cited training, 21% cited communications, 21% cited communi uh, supervision, and uh, uh, two of the respondents indicated the use of checklists, which, by the way, I'm a huge fan of. Um, in this particular question, there were sometimes multiple responses where an applicator may say, well, I've uh, strengthened my procedures and I'm doing more training, and so that would get counted in both areas. 80% um, of respondents had uh, at least one response or more in terms of uh, initiatives they've undertaken to uh, manage this change and, and put, move it through to their staff. So where does the rubber meet the road? Well, uh, time is money. And, and so I was also intrigued to ask manure applicators, um, how much longer it, do you estimate it's taking for you to plan, uh, pump, and after pumping complete a manure application job with a swine client. And about 45% of the respondents indicated that it was at least 10% or more time required. And I think when you reflect on uh, the full in information that comes through the survey, um, you'll see the places where the extra time is being spent and uh, you'll see why they're finding that it's uh, taking more time with the expectations of their clients with this virus. 
Um, and uh, my final uh, comment on that is, is the most difficult area that they're finding to deal with, of course, is cleaning, disinfecting, and drying the uh, application equipment and related equipment. And closely related to this is sanitation and downtime. And I think when you, when you think of manure application today, it's capital intensive. The equipment that the applicators are using and, and uh, procure in uh, this day and age is expensive. Their window of time to get their application done is short. And so I think you can appreciate that uh, um, time is money and uh, that's why uh, downtime for letting uh, clean equipment dry is a bit of a challenge for them as well. Um, so we did ask about which additional areas of research would be beneficial and uh, uh, of course they're interested in learning more about the transfer of the virus in manure and how it's transmitted. Um, there was interest in the concept of could we sterilize the manure and kill the virus in the manure? Um, how does it survive? Uh, so a number of different things. 50% uh, of the respondents had suggestions and I will be providing these on to Lisa and if there's other researchers or groups on the phone that are interested in exactly what the uh, comments were about further research, please let me know and I can get that to the research organization that you're uh, thinking of because I think that's an important outcome of this survey is uh, how can we work together to um, overcome this. And so there were a number of, uh, as I indicated, there was uh, verbatim responses and I won't go through all of these. Um, but just to, to read off the first one, uh, the prevalence of the virus in manure and the potential transfer from applied manure to other hog farms. What is the kill rate of the virus post-application on field? And I can see online that uh, those questions are popping up in your heads as well as in the, in the minds of manure applicators. Uh, so those are certainly, uh, you know, common questions. Um, and so what, what I'd like to do is, uh, is just give you some insight into how some of the practices that are currently going on, and um, I'm not saying these are all new, some of these are existing practices that have been used for years because biosecurity has always been important to manure applicators. I would suggest that as a result of PEV, in some cases they're taking this to a new level. Some people may be doing things they didn't used to do. Um, but certainly one of the key protocols before pumping is planning the entrance and exit to uh, have minimal crossover. Um, and so uh, some ways that we're seeing this being implemented is mapping and thinking, planning which routes are being taken, as well as uh, looking at the equipment piece by piece and where, where on the site is that equipment going to go? Does that equipment have to come to this job site? How can we minimize the possibility of cross-contamination? And so in the case of mapping, here's a, an illustration where the red line represents a uh, traffic flow and it's a highway. The yellow and the blue lines represent secondary roads. The red circles represent uh, hog barns, barns with swine in them. And so the manure applicator will use this information in um, determining what routes do they think that truck traffic, employee traffic is going to take to the barns and then trying to, to take other roads and stay off of the common roads that uh, the other traffic is traveling on, once again, to uh, minimize the risk of cross-contamination. I mentioned that uh, they're looking at all the equipment and how can we minimize uh, equipment that could cross-contaminate. Uh, um, in some areas, uh, farms are buying pumps and certain pieces of manure application equipment that used to get moved from farm to farm and keeping it on the farm so that it's not moving off the farm. So here's an example of a pump that uh, certain clients uh, have purchased of this manure applicator and they are keeping that equipment on the farm rather than moving it. Similarly, uh, they are buying their own connectors uh, onto the storage and hoses and those aren't being transferred around. And so they're rethinking and doing a risk assessment step by step you know, how can we uh, minimize the chance of disease spread? We also talked earlier about the line of separation and uh, so in some cases um, manure applicators are getting site maps from the farmer of 
showing here's the layout of where the barns are, the lagoons are, the fields are, the driveway and the access is, um, and, and sketching out, well, here's where the line of separation exists. And uh, uh, an idea here that I think might have some merit because uh, I was a little bit surprised how challenging it is for people to know where this line of separation is, is perhaps producers could have some pylons um, that when it's manure application time, they bring the pylons out and uh, place them on their yard where the line of separation is, connect them with yellow hazard tape so that the, the staff of the barn as well as the manure application staff can physically see there's the line of separation. The manure application crew is supposed to be over there. We're supposed to be over here, um, something like that. Uh, after pumping, you know, disinfecting is uh, clearly something that's been a challenge and uh, that a lot of work has gone on on. And uh, just to give you an example of the, some of the kind of equipment that's being used today, um, this is a power washer unit that's being used by a manure applicator crew in Iowa. And uh, as you can see, they, they take the washing very seriously and uh, are well equipped to bring their water on site so they don't have to cross that line of separation. Um, and, to, and to get that water heated up so that they can not only clean uh, and get all the organic material off of the equipment because, you know, the disinfectant only works if you've got all the organic material off. Um, and then, of course, drying is the third part of that clean, disinfect, dry cycle. And so that concludes my comments for today. I guess my take-home message is there is no question in my mind that this has changed um, the way manure application is being done, and it is a significant um, change initiative that the industry is going through right now. Thank you.